retrospective, because it's a retrospective, I think I'll get going here. Um, uh, I'm going to try to keep this retrospective uh, shorter today, um, but I want to begin with, um, with inviting any questions related to that DIP model that uh, we saw yesterday, recognizing that it came at the, uh, it was a multi-scale model of uh, a, a significant size and, and sophistication, but it came at the end of the day, and uh, perhaps there's questions which have grown since then, or questions which you wanted to ask then, but you wanted to go stretch your legs. Are there any questions related to that model that I could help answer now, or which Young, um, who's also nearby, could, uh, could, could help answer? Anything? I'm sure Young will be glad to share um, that <coughs> a look at that model with you if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, we have, uh, I would note, uh, a growing number of publications on that model. Um, one recently appeared in a PLOS One that focused on the uh, on the participatory side of that project. Although Young didn't emphasize it heavily in her presentation, that um, modeling project, um, which is still ongoing in some uh, form, particularly uh, childhood uh, obesity modeling extensions to it, that modeling project did involve a, a very strong participatory component. Um, some of those slides you saw, which um, she had a, a slide, I think, which included photos from some of the uh, group model building sessions, um, which were um, uh, instrumental in, in helping to motivate areas of the model. Um, and uh, there were recurrent meetings with stakeholder groups to talk about the evolving model structure, solicit input, solicit critique, et cetera. And that whole participatory process was very important to the, um, in, to the conception of uh, the model's delivery of value. And this is detailed in a paper which appeared uh, with Louise Freebairn, um, who really was the key uh, the director for the project as a whole from the Australian Capital Territories. Um, and you'll, you'll find that uh, paper online now. I believe it appeared in PLOS One. And there's now a second paper as well that focuses um, on additional components uh, of the model, um, which uh, has appeared uh, in a uh, recent uh, conference um, as a full paper uh, conference. And there's additional papers in the journal, uh, journal pipeline. Um, I believe another one was just recently accepted, et cetera. So um, a lot more on that will be coming out if you're interested in finding out more, either about the process side of it, which was very rich, or the side of it technically, uh, or the finding side, um, myself or Young uh, could help um, um, connect you to relevant people or, or papers, et cetera, okay? So just something to know about that. Um, that's the DIP model, a really exciting uh, model and one that uh, broke ground on a number of fronts that does make use of hybrid multi-scale techniques with SD modeling in ABM, but in a savvy way that allows for uh, uh, very, very good scalability. Okay, um, uh, I would like to uh, make a few other points though. Bearing in mind, I'm trying to keep my comments brief so we can jump into, into work uh, jointly involving projects, okay? Um, so one point here um, is uh, something related to Wade's um, presentation just now. And you'll see this again when um, other, others present. I know Wade's presentation coming on pertussis will show an interface which, um, like the one you saw briefly, um, summarizes model dynamics according to many different output metrics. So you can sort of look at it and get a sense of what's going on along different age groups um, over time, see those age-specific epi curves, as well as those that are across the population, see some aspects of population structure, et cetera. This is um, a notable feature of agent-based models that I want to highlight. Um, I may have alluded to it purely in passing before, but when you're picking 
um, a modeling type. Um, one thing to bear in mind is the outcome metrics um, that you're going to be using for that model and the degree to which either for validation purposes, calibration purposes, stakeholder communication purposes, and um, and understanding model dynamics, um, what sort of outputs you need. Um, if your outcomes are key to the model goals, you want to assess you know, the degree to which one intervention yields more favorable outcomes to another. You need a model that can produce the outcomes you're interested in as an endogenous, um, uh, endogenous factor from the model. And when it comes to um, model outputs, um, what is expressible in a reasonable form will depend on model structure. Um, so if you have an aggregate model, for example, uh, say an aggregate system dynamics model uh, that doesn't break things down by age groups, you're going to have a very difficult time having any sort of output that uh, can be compared with empirical data that's age specific. Because the model just doesn't have the requisite granularity to to resolve what's going on in this age group or that age group. It kind of jumbles all people together in one big heap, so to speak. Um, in an agent-based model, um, one of the hallmarks or characteristics of these models is that we have individuals uh, distinguished, um, individuated, you know, as, as particular people, and each such person, say, each such agent in a model can be associated with certain characteristics. So we might have different ages. And these ages in general um, could be, um, you know, captured to, uh, to different levels of uh, not merely integer precision, but, um, uh, you know, different uh, that, are, that are expressed in, in terms of real numbers, okay? So we could have for example, people's ages of varying sorts. We're not limited to age categories, um, uh, et cetera. You get the idea. And one of the things that this allows, which is frankly rather nice from my perspective, is the ability to summarize the population in as fine-grained metrics as you'd like with respect to attributes like this. Maybe, maybe it's not age. Maybe you're keeping track of people's birth weight. Or maybe you're keeping track of their weights or BMI levels. But whatever it is, by virtue of having the ability to express in a continuous fashion or a fashion that has discrete breakdowns but very fine grained um, very readily, you can sort of summarize the population characteristics in as fine grained or as coarse grained a way as you like. So if we want to summarize over the entire population of Wade's model, for example, the, the the overall crude prevalence of chickenpox, or for that matter, shingles in the population, we can do so as a single aggregate metric. By contrast, if we want to summarize it uh, on two-year age groups, um, we could do so. Ten-year age groups, no problem. Five-year age groups, uh, straightforward, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we could summarize it differentially uh, for the first three years of life uh, by six month age groups or in the first year of life by two month age groups and the rest of life in very coarse grained categories. That much flexibility is straightforward to make use of um, within, an, uh, within, an, uh, within a model that's individuated where each person is distinguished because we can simply summarize the underlying continuous values of of age or birth weight or what have you in, as, uh, in, in whatever categories we want. By contrast, if you have a system dynamics model that's not aggregate, but say divide, divided into 10 year age categories, you don't really have the luxury of breaking things down into as fine grained a category as you will sometimes want. And so you're kind of, you're, you're more limited in how you can summarize it. You can aggregate upwards, you know, clump age categories together um, into one big age category, to one big population-wide measure, or into 20-year age categories, or what have you. But you can't really break it apart into smaller ones. And with an agent-based model, you can, which is uh, sometimes favorable. So those uh, graphs that Wade showed of age-specific quantities, or population pyramids, or what have you, 
These are readily possible on H-based models in part because of this underlying situation. We have these individuals and we can, summar just like in a population in the world, we could summarize individuals' characteristics according to any number of different metrics um, based on, you know, choosing survey questions that bring it, you know, have the right breakdown. So we can do so with an age-based population. And this, this actually points at a deeper level. I won't go into this now. I might go into it on Friday. Of the fact that actually there's a lot of similarities between what we do with simulated individuals in a pop and individuals in a simulated population and what we can do in the real world with data from from populations around us, which are populations of individuals. Often we can use an agent-based model to um, in ways that are that are directly comparable to what we do in, in the external world. We can conduct simulated study designs in an agent-based model. We can summarize the outcomes of interventions in a simulated model in a way completely comparable to how we do so in the world. We can, we can apply statistical metrics to our population um, that are known to, be, to have certain limitations or gaps and compare them to statistics in the world characterizing those limitations and gaps in the simulation model um, so that we're aware of them. Um, we could imagine uh, having a simulated population where we model response bias or known issues when people report their weight, a certain distortion involved, and compare statistics where that's captured from a simulated population to, to similar statistics from the world. So having a simulated population allows a great deal of flexibility with it in terms of summarizing factors or comparing against the world. That's one thing I want to say. We can always aggregate up, and because we're dealing with an agent-based model with a very fine-grained um, distinction, we can aggregate up in different ways according to our needs, okay? That's point one. Another point that's related to this is that System dynamics is an extraordinarily powerful way, offers an extraordinarily powerful way of viewing the world. Um, I had noted before that its way of viewing the world is based upon two central concepts. One of them elevated even a little bit more than the other. Feedback and, and, and uh, accumulation. Okay? Um, stocks represent accumulations and we have feedbacks in model that shape the dynamics of the systems. Feedbacks are central for system behavior, just as much as, you know, if I, um, if I were to try to balance a ruler on my finger um, and do so, I can keep it going uh, looking at it, um, but if I were to close my eyes, be unable to see which ways it's, it's turning, it would quickly fall. Feedback is central for stability and achieving things in the world, and it's central for dysfunction, like the, uh, like the uh, feedback effects that, that Bryce struggled with yesterday on the microphone, where things can quickly go out of control. <coughs> feedback is a fundamental shaper of the dynamics we see from the world. And you may wonder, what's the role of feedback if this is the case, in system dynamics, it's enshrined. It's how we describe systems. It's in a way that brings out the feedback. We use stock and flow models in system dynamics, and the feedbacks are obvious, actually. You see loops around where, you know, we have susceptibles and we have infectives. Jason, make sure this is captured. And, and recovered individuals, perhaps. And, and we see the feedbacks very visually between them because uh, people say are getting infected, and as we have more infections, the chance that a, a susceptible, more infectives, the chance that a given susceptible in the next little unit of time, say a day, gets infected, uh, rises. If we have a thousand people around who are infectious around us compared to one, compared to zero, we'll have a greater chance of infection with that larger number, okay? So we have feedbacks that are very clear in a system dynamics diagram. Stock and flow diagram, as well as causal loop diagram, which really brings them out. This is central to how system dynamics communicates 
one of its core concepts because of just how important feedbacks are in shaping the world. Accumulations are also central to many depictions such as stock and flow diagrams. Um, and so if you look at a stock and flow diagram, you will see writ large in the structure of the arrows which show dependencies, you will see the feedbacks, okay? You will see the stock I, the more infectious people there are, the more contacts there are between infectious and susceptible peoples, all of the things being equal, and the more new infections there'll be, and that will further boost the more infected people. The more people, the more people recover from the infectious stock, the more it drains down the number of infectives and the fewer recoveries there will be. So, so we see these feedbacks in a system dynamics diagram in a central way. We see, in fact, in a stock and flow diagram, or Forster diagrams, it's sometimes called, we see these stocks and flows. It's part of the method to communicate these things, okay? And uh, some of those slides, which I showed earlier, um, bring these out in the diagrams. You may wonder, where do feedbacks play a role? If they're so important in the world, and accumulations, where do they play a role in age-based modeling? Is it we have to forswear feedbacks? We blind ourselves to feedbacks? We, we view the world in a system dynamics mo um, modeling perspective? We, we see all these rich feedbacks? And then we have to put them aside and say we're, we're, we'll ignore them or we're unable to express them uh, over in the, on the agent-based modeling side. Far from it, ladies and gentlemen. Far, far from that, fortunately. Um, while feedbacks are central in, in system dynamics, it turns out that they also play a very large role in agent-based modeling. Okay? Um, here within system dynamics, uh, we see them quite directly, such as this uh, feedback uh, here, for example. Um, uh, and, and those feedbacks are fundamental shapers. In an agent-based model, they are there. They're just less obvious, okay? Um, and they play just as big a role. So I'm gonna highlight, oh, oh, okay. I thought you've been seeing these things, but evidently not, okay. Um, Switch over to HDMI. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, there we go. Um, in, a, in an H-based model, we have feedbacks as well. And you may have seen this in Price's diagram. I don't know if you noticed yesterday. But there's reciprocal causality going on here between activity and weight. And I actually alluded to this yesterday. But I want to emphasize it because it's worth emphasizing. Some people think, Agent-based modelers don't care about feedback. No, they care. They care a lot about feedback often. Um, Elizabeth Brook, another prominent agent-based modeler in health, um, whose work is particularly um, uh, well-known well within uh, neighborhood uh, preference dynamics and, and uh, other aspects of, of choice. Um, her work, uh, you know, points to feedback as, as, as perhaps arguably the most important factor that we try to capture with an agent-based model. And um, you may wonder, where is this captured? So we say that activity, physical activity depends on weight, and we say that weight depends on physical activity, but where are the connections? Well, we've shown them here visually for a reason, to bring them out, to make them explicit. But you don't see connections that any logic provides automatically between these. Suffice it to say that, that there's a, a way in which we capture the interaction between state charts. That's quite similar to what we did yesterday with that color variable. Do you remember that? We use color to change people's, to change the color that they were shown in the, in the model. And so when they became a smoker, uh, an active smoker, current smoker that turned red, and when they quit smoking, they turned magenta. Remember that? Yeah, okay. Um, we set a variable, and what you're gonna see here is that, that um, there's actually some variables beneath here that whisper about this. Uh, so weight change activity multiplier. Activity change weight multiplier. Basically, these are referring to the fact that as your weight changes, it changes your propensity to change activity. Um, 
levels and vice versa. Okay, so there's an interaction captured here. It's not made obvious and patent. It's not made really clear by any logic. But there's a big linkage going on between these two state charts. Um, that means presence in one influences the other. And one way it's often captured is when I go, say, to an obese state, it will set a, a certain multiplier over here that maybe makes it more likely I lower my activity levels because of my weight, um, or vice versa. Um, so in short, we can articulate some of these feedbacks through variables. Personally, I don't like that, but that's current, currently sort of the, the way in which it's expressed. I personally think it needs to be brought up more explicitly. But feedbacks are a central feature in agent-based models. And we will see, in fact, this example with an SIR-type model um, a bit later this afternoon. We are going to see it with networks, and we'll be going through several types of networks and seeing the effect of network dynamics on infection spread. And we'll, in fact, see uh, the effects of feedback, even though they won't be quite as broad out as they are in a system dynamics diagram visually. And this is one of the, the, the cautions you should have when approaching agent-based modeling. It's not it's not a matter that feedbacks aren't important uh, when we put on the agent base hat. They're just as important. They're just not as made, they're not made as uh, amplified um, in terms of how the diagrams are shown. And I think it's a loss to, to agent based modeling because often they're of central interest to us as models. But more than that, I will note this other issue of accumulation. So this was about feedback, and it was about accumulation, I argued, are two, two central considerations that system dynamics emphasizes and that are emphasized in system dynamics diagrams, with, with um, stock and flow diagrams particularly emphasizing both of these visually. We have accumulations in stocks. Where does accumulation play a role in age-based model? Oh, it's everywhere. We just don't reify it in the model structure. The model is articulated at a lower level, but often we will summarize an agent based model in terms of categories similar to what we use in system dynamics. Um, we have all these individual agents, but for example, we will count up the number that are susceptible, count up the number of that are infected and count up the number of, of recovered. And I don't know if it was in Wade's um, outputs there, but very commonly we will have a pie chart, you know, which which has you know S, I, and R uh, summarizing the status of the population, and we will summarize these flows as they have occurred in a nature-based model as useful constructs for thinking about model dynamics. It's not that the model's articulated at that level of, of aggregate flows. It's just they're very useful ways of thinking about what's going on in the model. So we will often have, and in fact, Wade had this, you know, epi curves or something which state the number of new infections within the past month that have occurred, right? You saw these kind of angular age-specific ones because the numbers were lower. Um, or you might have seen ones where the numbers were higher um, for the population as a whole. The point is, these are summaries um, that correspond to number of new infections, the rate of new infections, people per month that have gotten infected. But they summarize the infection transitions, these state chart transitions of a lot of people are summarized in these kind of measures that correspond to these flows. So often I find myself, as a modeler who uses system dynamics all the time and agent-based all the time, I find myself analyzing agent-based models in ways that actually mirror how I would build a system dynamics model of this situation. It's just the agent-based model allows me to resolve extra details, to capture things like 
longitudinal statistics, how long people stayed you know, in this state, how many times they've presented for care before, how many times they've been infected, historical information you can never capture in an aggregate model. But I summarize the characteristics of that agent-based model in terms that are familiar from an aggregate system dynamics model. But I'm not beholden to that. I'm not limited to that. I'm not limited to only talk about across all the population, what's the rate of new infections? You know, 10 people per month, 20 people per month. I'm not limited to that. I can look at things, slice and dice it in any number of different ways. I could ask about infections. How many people got infected within a family? How many people got infected outside of the family? Some of Wade's models, like the pertussis model, your family structure, and you have linkages to other people based on distance. Um, so I have neighbors and I can infect them, but I have family structure that's privileged because there's a closer level of contact involved. And you might be interested in new infections that occur in the family, you know, or from parent to child or child to parent, breaking it down in that way in ways you could never do easily in a sy aggregate system dynamics model. But we often will use the constructs from system dynamics aggregate models as summary measures about what's going on in our agents. Does that make sense? So we, we use the, the concepts of accumulation and the concepts of feedback in very important ways in understanding a model. And feedback is actually reified. It's actually captured. I shouldn't say it's reified. It's captured operationally. We, we, we operationalize it in terms of some of these linkages in ways that vary. Um, message sending is one of the main ways. I send you a message and you send me back a message or what have you. But these are often summary measures um, that are convenient, useful for thinking through things. We think about the stock and flow dynamics. You know, maybe we see, for example, from an agent-based model, the number of infections rising, and we see it going down, the, t the prevalence of infection. I, 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 stand, I, I stand to be uh, corrected. This is a prevalence of infection. Maybe we see it rising and going down. Maybe this is prevalent case count. Okay, I'll just, just imagine it in a very simple measure. The prevalent case count of a fixed, of a closed population. That's a cohort, let's say. And the number of people get it who are infected rise and then decline, right? Um, in an age-based model, if that's what we see, if that's our summary of this population over time, the number of cases over time, um, we know that it's telling us something about the aggregate flows. From principles of stocks and flows, we know during this time here, at the, at the at earlier on, when the prevalent case count was rising, inevitably it meant more people were getting, developing the condition than were recovering from it per month. So there was an inflow greater than the outflow. And during the time it was declining, we know that the outflow is greater than the inflow. Um, so the number of people with the condition is declining. And you may say, well, where is the stock? That, that's reasoning we use for stocks. The stock is a summary of this bigger population, but it's still useful to reason about that population's dynamics in terms of the number of people infected in this way, and it's perfectly legitimate. So, so we can use stock and flow reasoning that we use with system dynamics, you know, about what it means for a stock to be increasing or decreasing to summarize an agent-based model. And it's very fruitful to do so. It's very powerful to do so. So don't think of needing to, you know, when you're coming to do agent-based modeling, you have, to, you have to take off your system dynamics hat and, you know, take off your system dynamics shoes and leave them at the door to apply agent-based modeling. No, no, system dynamics, aggregate system dynamics understanding of a population, you can use fruitfully to analyze an agent-based characterization of that population. It's just that we are not beholden to that. We're not limited to that aggregate articulation. We are, we are characterizing the population at a finer grain level, but we can always aggregate up 
to familiar high-level summaries that we might use in an, agent, in an aggregate system dynamics model, including stock values of stocks, values of flows, and we can reason about them using stock and flow reasoning. I hope my students have let this sink in, because it's a very powerful notion. Agent-based modeling enables, helps support, I shouldn't say it enables, it helps support. It is subject to and can support reasoning uh, of the sort we do with, with system dynamics models. Agent-based models just give us extra flexibility for how we summarize this, uh, this underlying population, but it is extremely fruitful to use the tool, the, the thinking tools from system dynamics to apply it to the population, much as looking at an external population we saw the prevalent case counts of reported cases rising, we'd say, well, inflow is greater than outflow and vice versa. Does that, does that make sense to people? Very, very useful. And this is one of the reasons I'm a big believer. If you're going to use system science, don't just constrain yourself to one technique. Um, don't make it like you're on the bed of Procrustes and you know, you have to chop off your legs just because they won't fit on the aggregate system on the image bed. Um, you, you, you can actually very fruitfully use concepts from one area to understand models in another area and vice versa. And it's that capacity to switch between these views that adds extra virtuosity, I might say, to some of the most accomplished practitioners. And I might add to some of the most accomplished students who come from my group. It's this ability to go back and forth between those perspectives and to tap the appropriate perspective for a certain level of analysis. With, with agent-based modeling, we have a lot more flexibility and we have the, the capacity to do this sort of reason about stocks and flows in different ways of subdividing the population with respect to you know, infection among women, separately from infection among men, or grouped if we want to do so, or among different age groups, or grouped, uh, you know, age specific, or, or grouped within aggregate modeling, um, or stratified modeling, we're more constrained. Um, but those were some, some points, and I don't believe I've ever articulated it um, in quite that level of specificity before for any event. And I, I hope you'll take it to heart. And students, if you didn't catch all of that, please review it on the videos, okay? Um, maybe I'll have a post boot camp quiz for my students. Mm. Um, not, don't worry, not for the participants. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, um, you'll light out of here. Um, okay, um, right. Um, Mm. Um, I'll mention one other thing that I, I mentioned yesterday. Um, for any coming from rich statistical traditions, use of these models does not mean leaving those traditions behind. It means using those traditions in ways that work with dynamic models instead of being replaced by dynamic models. I use bias statistics all the time. In our, in our, uh, I've been known to supervise theses, which are on bias statistical on bias statistical concepts. Um, I use machine learning extensively, but I do so in ways that are system aware and system competent. That are um, that um, are 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 capable of of understanding complex systems. And these techniques have a place in that in certain, in certain spheres of application. Um, and uh, this is a matter of, of learning where those techniques fit. And I'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about uh, how model interfaces with data. Um, but I will further note, for anyone coming from that background, that Within a traditional biostatistics, but 
um, a lot of applications of statistics in the health sciences. Um, there has predominantly been a tradition of working with models that use co as covariates, um, obviously. They're, they're using observable quantities. And in statistics, um, in the past, uh, past few decades, there's been a real growth, particularly on the Bayesian side, of models that include latent factors as well, right? And, and there's some, a growing use of this within, uh, within the health sciences, right? So we, we do latent class analysis, et cetera. We, we reason about, um, about hidden factors. And much of uh, Judea Pearl's work on, on causality um, gives reference to the fact that many of the variables that are operative causally are in fact um, late. Within the sphere of dynamic modeling, of, of mechanistic models, it is almost inevitable that a great many of the variables that we deal with are latent. We don't have the luxury of measuring them, but they are posited to play an important role in terms of the causative pathways, or to use the language of critical realism, of which I am fond, the generative pathways. And for some statistical modelers coming to these techniques, you may be scared or hesitant or wary of this. But you should realize that across traditions, and particularly system dynamics and agent-based modeling, it is um, a central feature of the tradition that you, because you're working with positive causal pathways to allow you to reason about counterfactuals, to offer a generative explanation for phenomena we see in the world and to ask what if questions that are counterfactual in nature, your model will typically need a significant substrate of these um, latent factors to reason about the underlying processes, the processes that underlie the data we do see, the data generating process that underlies observed data from the world. And, 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 and that can give um, pause and uh, concern uh, to some individuals, but you should recognize that um, it is a phenomenon that you that is mirrored within statistics, within a growing number of models, Bayesian um, most notably, where, where latent factors are central, and, and where you're reasoning about latent quantities as they, um, as they play a role within um, uh, hierarchical or networks, you know, uh, Bayesian networks, graphical Bayesian networks, or, or, uh, or hierarchical uh, Bayesian models, for example. And mathematical statisticians have been dealing with this for a while. It just hasn't been a tradition which has been quite as prominent within the biostatistical area until recent years. Well, and, and where it started to, I think, catch more steam. But one thing I want to emphasize about this is that when we're characterizing things in a dynamic model, we're therefore generally operating not on just the observed quantities, the measured quantities. We're, we're positing an underlying theory for what's going on where those quantities may be present, but they're not always the quantities that are, 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 are central to the causative pathways. They may be summaries of them, or they may be incomplete observations of the underlying quantities. And so, for example, in Wade's models, um, in a model you hear about uh, pertussis, one of several models that's come out of our group, and, and uh, led uh, publications in these areas, one of the things you'll find is a big disparity between what seems to be going on in adults in terms of cases of pertussis and what's reported. And system science will often be helping us to reason about what's going on in the underlying system in light of incomplete evidence for it. So reporting in adults for pertussis is a, is a good case in point. There's reason to believe that among adults, pertussis exists at levels well beyond what's reported. And even for something like flu, 
the majority of cases of flu are never are never reported by the public health system. I mean, we all know, right? I mean, year after year, uh, we've probably gotten flu uh, every few years or or more. And you know, how many of those times have you actually gone and 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 visited your physician for that? And how many of those times do you think the physician has reported it? It's a comparatively small number. But flu is transmitted by connections from a lot more people than the ones that happen to be reported. Pertussis is reported for a comparatively small number of adults, but it's posited to play a role in the population at higher levels. When it comes to diabetes, one of our biggest concerns um, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, you know, being able to um, lower the burden um, uh, is sometimes on undiagnosed cases, right? Who progress to points of risk with respect to complications without, perhaps without engaging in care seeking because they're, they're uh, in rural areas or they have little access in the states because of lack of insurance or, or because they have a lack of trust with the healthcare system because of language difficulties or because of undocumented status in the states or what have you. So the point is that often we deal in epidemiology with the reality that we're missing some of the pieces of the system. And, and dynamic modeling is reasoning about the underlying system. It can help us reason about that disparity and help us reason about screening efforts and efforts in, uh, you know, for reform of the medical system or, or insurance mechanisms that may lower that disparity. But in these models, we have diagnosed and often undiagnosed cases. Um, or you know, we'll have cases that actually are, are infection cases, and only a fraction of them get reported. This is very common. Um, and uh, you should realize it's a big feature. Because occasionally, I find in my classes that I teach students from the health sciences struggling because they're articulating a model only in terms of the observables, and they're not thinking about what lies beneath. Dynamic modeling is reasoning about what lies beneath, and that can be liberating when it comes to reasoning about you know, disparities between what we know and what we need to know, or, 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 or the full situation of the world. So just be aware that, that if you're coming from a, a, a background of statistics within the, uh, the health sciences, that is often something you have to come to terms with with these models. They embrace, they're not afraid to, to represent explicitly posited causality among latent factors. And, and that sets them apart, but in good company with a lot of recent statistical practice, which, which does um, dignify latent factors and no longer treats them as second-class citizens, or just omits them from models. So those are some, some comments there. Any questions or comments uh, before we turn over now to project work? Okay. Yeah. Yes, we're going to do G some GIS in the afternoon, in involving geographical. Um, uh, so these are models that include geography. And I'm going to be talking about the ways in which geography, geographic information, um, uh, or, or GIS uh, components, um, uh, interface with models, um, where it can be useful, um, how it can be useful with these models. And we're going to take a look at some models which do so as kind of exemplars, including some I've provided to you. Um, and to zoom in and, and kind of move around, having a mouse is helpful. Okay. So that, that will be uh, this afternoon. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, Great, so I'm going to stop this and uh, I will turn over now to, um, to a discussion of, of, of project components. And I've been monitoring this. Um, I've 